Heavenly Father, we praise you because in Christ Jesus we have new life. You give us new life. For all who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. And in that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we are now reconciled to you and able to have that relationship with you that we were created for, Father. To walk with you, to live for you, to, to have a life now that is set on the right trajectory to have a life of meaning of purpose to live our lives for your glory father you have called us to far more than most of us dare imagine and by that father i know we're not talking about prosperity or this that or the other but father you have called us to live our lives fully alive with you and for your glory and not just to settle for the external forms of religion, God, where it's all things that we stuff in our head, but that are somehow separated from or divorced from our everyday life. Father, Jesus Christ is to be our life. So ask and pray, Lord, as we look at your word, that your spirit would take your word and open our eyes. And I pray that you would help us to leave here today changed in Jesus' name, amen. Good to see you this Labor Day weekend. Glad that you're here. Uh, just to, we're going to start off actually with a quote from uh, a Dr. Tony Evans that really grabbed me, and it fits perfectly within what we're actually talking about. Uh, as we look at Abram, who is now who? Abram. Yes! It took a while, right? But we're there. Uh, Dr. Evans said this, and I want you to please write that. This is worth writing down. This is good stuff. Right information without right action is wasting everybody's time. Hear that again. Right information, now we're talking about knowing things up here about God. Right information, stuffed up here in your noggin, right? Without right action, in other words, it doesn't lead me to do anything, that's wasting everything everybody's time. Faith believes. Faith trusts. Faith acts. Faith is willing to wait. Faith trusts God. Faith trusts the Word of God. Faith trusts the timing of God. Faith trusts the power of God. Faith trusts and when that happens, it's useful to everyone. But if all we do is stuff information here and we justify compartmentalizing it, which we all do in various ways, here, how we live, how we relate to one another, how we act, so on and so forth, it's useless. Does that make sense? We could probably stop right there and meditate on that. And maybe we should. Our culture, our world does not need simply more theological information. Now, the theology is very important. Don't get me wrong. I am very serious about that. But if all that ever happens is that we accumulate stuff up here and it does not change what's going on here and in here, it's useless. Or as James might say, faith without works is dead. A few questions, and these are obviously things that we have to answer privately. But um, observation, I believe that over the years that I have seen and or heard uh, through various means, various ways, various conversations, so much to the point where I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure there's a pattern. So many professing Christians don't have many stories of God working in their lives right now for a few reasons. One, their faith has stopped growing. They have settled for what's up here. It's not sunk into here. It's not sunk into relationships. It's not sunk into action. So their faith stops growing. Well, my faith stopped growing. Well, I would just encourage you, go back to here first. 
Get plugged in amongst the people of God. You're saved into community. Spend time in prayer and just see what happens, how the Lord might renew your faith. Some people don't have any stories or about adventures about the things that God is doing in their life because they're, maybe you can identify impatient. Impatient. You ever get impatient with God? I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the miry clay and he set my feet on a solid rock and he put a new song in my mouth is what the psalmist says in Psalm 40. But that requires waiting patiently on the Lord. Some of us don't have these stories, these adventures, these, these things where we say, well, this is what God has done in my life. This is what he's doing. And I would ask you right now, what is he doing in your life right now? Not what he did when you were a child, not what he did 10 years ago, five years ago, one year. What's he doing now? And for a lot of us, that, that stresses us because we don't want to be asked that question because if truth be told, we're saying, I, I don't know because... We're just really not spending much time with God. We're not falling by faith. We're not walking with him. Our stories were all things from way back when. We get impatient with God, so we get frustrated with God. God, you're not coming through the way I want you to, when I want you to, how I want you to, so now I'm angry. I'm going to pitch a fit. When you're, when you're a kid, any of you ever pitch a fit in the grocery store line? <laughs> I like when you can say things and people laugh because it's like, I, you know, some of you are very compliant children. God bless you. And so you're saying, nope, I didn't do that. I guarantee there's stuff you pitched to fish about somewhere. I mean, I've been in the grocery line. But man, your, your parents are taking you through the grocery store and everything, looking, you know, whatever, boring cans of this, food, this, that. But then they're so strategic, right? They place the stuff that kids are going to want right there at the checkout line where you're all jammed up. You're parked. I remember when my kids were small and you're like, there's a party, you're, you're thinking, okay, you're trying, you're trying to teach them and you're wanting to teach them. Hannah didn't want everything. She just wanted to experience the touch of everything. What would that feel like? That feels really cool. So let me touch, no, 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 no. We're not going to do that. Christian, on the other hand, he'd be the kind of person that would be like, he might just slip something in the cart. Like, no, we're not doing that. We put it back. We don't need that. But dad. But dad. So you may not be a grocery cart person, but a lot of us treat God that way. If we don't get what we want, when we want, we start getting weird. We start trying to manipulate or we throw a, a fit. Or so I've heard. Some of us don't have stories because we stop growing in our faith or we become impatient. Some of us have no stories right now in terms of how God is working in our life because we've become somewhat domesticated. I am a proper church person who goes to church at the proper time, does the proper things, and therefore da da da. And we have reduced this whole radical concept of following the Lord Jesus Christ to me simply being an occasional church person. You can be a great churchman and absolutely not be a follower of Christ. I'm not trying to make you mad at me. I'm trying for us to be alert right now. Okay? Some of our stories have stopped because we've kind of told the Lord, you know what, I, it's somebody else's turn. Yeah, there was some pretty cool stuff when I was younger. Those were pretty wild times. But you know what, I got a family now, or I'm older now, or I'm retired now, or I'm getting ready to retire. I got grandkids, or I got kids, or I've got this and that and the other going on. I got schedules and this, that, and so on and so forth. And so, you know... Here they are, send them, God. Send someone else. If you're here, you and I are still called to follow. Are you here? Okay. Well, then guess what? You're still supposed to be following. And you know when you stop? You keep following until you see him face to face. Now, have you seen, are, 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 are any of you currently, I just need to know, in heaven right now, seeing him face to face? You, you sure? Okay, so we'll make sure we're good on that. So, so we can all say that we're all supposed to be following now, right? Okay, good, good, good. Just, you never want to assume these days. You never want to assume. We are called to follow, to run well, to finish well, until we see him face to face. And sometimes our stories stop because of all the complexities 
that happens in a fallen and broken world become larger in our life than God himself. Now, I know no one here struggles with that. I'm sure I'm the only one who at times faces things where you're saying, Lord, I just don't see how. And you freak out, right? There's no way, God. There's no way. And then you've got a whole list of things why whatever the issue is, it can't be solved. It might be family problems. It might be, uh, it might be relational problems with people. It might be your work. It might be financial needs. It might be your health. It might be any number of things you're looking at where you're saying, this is just too big. Nothing is bigger than God. So now that I hope that we're awake, I know I, I'm awake now. I've had a lot of coffee, so I may talk really fast today. <laughs> Review of where we have been. Because all of this leads up to where we are with Abraham. In quick review, Abraham is now 99 years old. It's been 24 years, 24 years older than a lot of you here. It's been 24 years since God first called him and made these promises to him. 24 years of waiting. Waiting, 24 years. That's a lot of your life, waiting. God shows up and reminds him. We saw this last week. I am God Almighty. Nothing is impossible for God all. If we believed that man, this world would be turned upside down. And he calls Abraham to walk with him in holiness, to be obedient. Abraham, fall, Abraham falls on his face to worship, and God reaffirms this covenant promise. And God changes Abram's name to Abraham from the father of many to the father of multitudes. And we saw that God gave Abraham the sign of the covenant circumcision. And we discussed all that that meant. And it was a sign that was to point to a greater reality, a changed life, a new relationship to and with God. The sign was not the main thing. The sign pointed something far greater. And we saw how we often ourselves will Focus and prefer signs as opposed to the substance of that which is even greater. And now we see that this man and his descendants were in covenant relationship with the living God. Those who refused the sign were refusing God. Those who rejected the covenant were rejecting uh, the Lord and were to be cut off from the community. And it's here that our story continues. Again, Abraham is 99 years old, has waited some 24 years. And you'll remember from last week, we, taught, we discussed whether the purpose of Semitic names or the importance of Semitic names. They're not like our names. When you and I name each other or say hi to each other, we're not thinking about, oh, the meaning of John's name, and John, I, I, I'm just pointing you out. I, I honestly don't remember the names. I don't know the English. It means what? God is, gracious. God is gracious. Okay, so it's the same. Great. So when I look at John, I don't go, "Hey, God is gracious." But guess what? In the Semitic days, they would that. That's how you would think in the ancient days, rather the Semitic peoples. So I would say, so to, so here's father of many with with no child, father of many now with one child. Now he's a father of multitude with one child, multitudes. To know the name was to know the person's identity, their blessing, their character. And now God is going to change his wife's name. Sarai finally becomes Sarah today. This is really cool for me because I keep stumbling over the names back and forth. So that's going to probably take two to three weeks for me to reprogram myself to calling them properly after all of this. Sarai means my princess. And in this context, I read all kinds of different things from different scholars. And, it, and I think the general the broad thing they could agree upon was that it probably was a name that was given at birth, some kind of a blessing. It's how her parents saw her. And our equivalent might be, I still see my daughter as my little princess, that kind of a thing. So something, a blessing like that. But God's going to change her name. Now, Sarai, at this point still, has heard Abram, Abraham talk, I did it again, talk a lot about God's promises. But she doesn't see how this is going to involve her. She doesn't see how this is actually going to work with her. She is old. Now, now at her age, it's, it's, it's very logical from our perspective to say, yeah, I, I, I haven't seen many women in the nursing home giving birth. I just haven't. So how, so how, right? So you, we don't look at Sarah and go, Sarah, you have no faith. I think she'd look at us and go, are you kidding me? You're telling me that? <laughs> you who walk nothing but by sight, you're telling me? So here's Sarah and she's trying to figure out, she's going to finish her years 
She's heard this promise, doesn't know how it's going to work. She is my princess, which is an honorable name, but she lacks one thing that will give her the greatest of honor in that culture, and that was a child. But God continues to work in this family to shape and to form them and to call him to themselves, to call them to faith, to adventure, to walk with him, to trust him, to wait on him. We've already seen 24 years of waiting. Let's look at what happens in chapter 17, verses 15 and 16. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Does that sound familiar? It should. This is what God has told Abraham, right? Kings of people shall come from her. So God's going to honor Sarah. He says, you're going to call her Sarah? And now that simply means princess, because that's what she's going to be known as. No longer my princess, as a father and mother might refer to her, but princess as name, as title, as fitting from the Lord, as declared as such. And just as he has said, nations will come from you, Abram. Kings will come from you, Abraham. The same is going to be true for her. And when you put all of this together, this immediately removes the question that there is any other way this promise is going to be fulfilled unless Sarah personally gives birth to this child of promise. And again, you look at that and you're going, that's, that's crazy. That stuff doesn't happen. Guess what? You know what God's about? God is all about that doesn't happen. Now, when you believe that, I'll take a little bit of stress off of you. But the moment, remember we talked in the very beginning of Abraham's story, when circumstances or people or things get bigger in our eyes than God, that's when the trouble starts. I'm going to ask you this several times in different ways throughout the message today as an application point. And so I want you to start thinking about it now. What or what, it may be one thing, it may be several things, are in your mind right now larger than God himself? Now, your Sunday school answers are n n nothing. Let me help you find out what that is. These are those things that cause you anger or stress or despair to the point when you look at them, you just don't see how anything good can come, how God could ever deal with that. You'll pray, but even when you're praying, it's kind of like, oh, Lord, I'm just praying because I know I'm supposed to, but I just, I just don't see how anything can change. So that's your thing or your things. So you think about whatever that thing or things is. We all have them, but we don't need to keep them. As a matter of fact, before we leave today, I'm going to ask that we lay those things down. Abraham's response is amazing to me as he is processing all of this. Look at verse 17 and following. Abraham fell on his face and he laughed. And he said to himself, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? So shall, shall Sarah, tongue twister, who is 90 years old, shall she bear a child? So you can picture this. The man is on his face and he's, he's laughing and he's just saying to himself, he's overwhelmed, how could this be? I mean, if this happens, I'll be 100, she'll be 90. Now, in Scripture, there's a laughter that gets you in trouble with God. And that's the laughter of skepticism, cynicism, mocking, the idea that God is going to do what he says he's going to do. And you can find instances of that in Scripture. God is not pleased by that. But that's not what's happening here. We have a couple of clues as far as why. One, Abraham is on his face. He is worshiping. Two, he, this is the context. This is a laughter that is mingled with joy, relief, amazement, awe, overwhelmed. He just, I, you're God, you're so, I can't believe this. I shall, this is, I'm going to be 100. She's going to be 90. This is not cynical. This is not skeptical. This is not mocking. This is just overwhelmed by God. And so the next question follows. When was the last time you were so overwhelmed by God's activity in your life? You just fell on your face. And whether it was laughed or you cried or you did both or you just said, God, you're so amazing. 
some of you are saying, well, that's not my personality type. And I granted, we all have different personality types. Some are more emotional than others. But I will simply tell you this. When you encounter the presence of the living God, I have never met a person who has truly encountered the spirit, the presence of the living God, and remained stoic. Well, hello, God. Yes. No. Every single time you'll see it in Scripture. And I will tell you, personal experience bears that. When you encounter the presence of God and you take in all that he is doing as best as your finite mind can grasp, it is traumatic. It's overwhelming. It is so much. But it's not one of those, yeah, that's not my personality types. I'm sorry. Even the most... Spock-like person here, were he or she to encounter the presence of the living God right now, would be traumatized. Abraham is just blown away. So I, a child be given to me when I'm 100 and Sarah's 90. We have waited so long. And that's the other part of, the, of all of this. We've waited so long. A lot of you have waited on things, haven't you? Maybe the salvation of a loved one. And were I to say, and I don't want you to embarrass because that loved one may be here with you. If you've ever agonized and prayed over and waited and waited and waited for a, someone in your family to come to faith in Christ or to stop playing games with God and to just surrender and you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and you waited and then when that came, you just, you didn't know what to say. You were blown away. I would bet that some of you have stories right now. You would raise your hand and go, man, yeah. I prayed and I waited. And the Lord, he took a lot longer than I thought. But God came through and I was just so blown away by that. Some of you have had circumstances where you thought, well, I, it may be a lack of a job or I'm wrestling with my job and, and, and I'm wrestling with how are we going to make ends meet? And I prayed and I prayed and I waited and it seemed like God at the very last minute and then God came through. I was at the point I kept wrestling back and forth. God, are you going to come through or you're not? I'm doing all that you're telling me to do and I'm believing and I'm trusting you and I'm, and then he comes through and you're just, <sighs> I can't believe, yet yeah, you're at a loss for words. The people who know their God, who walk with their God, who learn to trust in him and wait upon him will have stories like this in their lives. I'm not saying your life is one continual parting of the Red Sea because the scripture doesn't even paint that idea. You will have many trials and troubles. But if your stories in terms of the great things that God has done in somewhere way back then, well, that means there's a relational problem right now. Are you following? Are you trusting? Are you believing? When was the last time? We often draw a blank because we don't persevere in prayer. We don't believe. We give in to cynicism. We lack faith. We don't get, uh, we don't wait on God. We get angry. We get frustrated. If God promises something, I will tell you this, he will do it. <laughs> So here's the next part of the question that I'm asking you to think about. Those things or that thing in your life that you're wrestling with, you might say, well, could you just like email me a verse? No, I want you to do something really crazy as a Christian to move from being spoon-fed milk to you go in here and you eat some spiritual meat and you can go open God's word. I'm not, we're not, I'm not a priest. I'm not the mediator between God and man. I'm here to teach, to equip, to do those things. But I'm going to encourage you to go dig and you go find. There are promises given to all believers that are universal. Okay? And what I mean by that is don't take something out of context. Now, if you have a question about context, I'll be, I'd love to help you. I sure don't want you taking a very specific promise given to, let's say, Elijah in one particular moment saying, God just promised this to me. It was like, well, actually, no, that was what he told Elijah. But there are universal promises in context for all believers to address those things in our lives. And I'm going to ask for you to dig and to write those things down and to start praying those and saying, Lord, you said in your word, and I want to trust you. But I'm going to tell you this, you can't separate that from actually walking with God. And that's what we also tend to do too, right? God, I want you to fix me, but, but I want you to stay out of my business. 
Nope, he is our life. And so as a surrender, Lord, I'm yours. I lay everything, all my junk, all my stuff, all these complexities, all my, all my stresses, everything here. And I ask you to please create in me a new and a clean heart. Give me clean hands and a clean heart. And Lord, I want to I wanna build my life on your word and on your promises. And so Lord, I'm going to start praying and just trusting in you. And I will wait upon you, God. What, are you willing to do that? We're talking at this point, 24 years in Abraham and Sarah's life. How long will you wait? Will you wait? Will you wait 24 minutes? Will you wait maybe 24 hours? Will you wait maybe a few months? I think 24 years. We are a very impatient people here. Life moves at a very rapid pace. We have to get 99 things done before noon, right? <laughs> we don't have time for those that don't. Patience is a virtue. Matter of fact, patience is required for our faith to grow. Verse 18, look at what Abraham says. And it's a very interesting response. This is not a lack of faith. This is something else. This is really, it's actually, it's, it's, very, it's very beautiful. Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. <laughs> While he's wrestling with all this, you might say, well, wait a minute. Is, is he suddenly like, like doubting or wanting to change? You know what this is? I want you to think with me. Abraham is, is human. Okay? Ishmael is his only son. He's 13 years old. He loves his son. He's asking something really interesting here. And, I'm, I, and I'll tell you, there's no doubt. Ishmael, if he were in your youth group, he'd be a handful. I mean, here, remember when Hagar was pregnant with him? He will be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone. This kid was a handful, I'm guessing, but Abraham loves him. It's like you fathers, I pray, love your children. And so he's, he's asking after all these years of waiting, and now he has this son, and for 13 years he's had this father-son relationship, and, and he has honor, and he loves his son. This is a request for Ishmael to be given a special place of promise. Could Ishmael receive the, the same kind of blessing that God has promised here? That's what he's asking. And God answers Abraham, and I want you to notice the graciousness. God said no. But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I've heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my, establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. Uh-oh, we're on the clock. <laughs> Here we go. A few things about what we just read. First, no, Ishmael is not the child of promise. This child of promise is going to come from the union of you and Sarah and you're going to have this other son and you're going to name him Isaac and that means he will laugh and it has a double meaning of source both Abraham and Sarah will laugh before it's all said and done and no doubt there would be great laughter and joy as they look this hundred year old man and this 90 year old woman at this child <laughs> how improbable that was and God says of Isaac, he will establish his covenant with him and with his offspring. In other words, the covenant is going to go through the line of Abraham and Isaac and to his descendants. But as for Ishmael, he's not forgetting Ishmael. God said, I will bless him as well. No, he's not going to be in this covenantal line. But you'll notice something if you're paying attention in verse 20. When the Lord talks to Abraham and he talks about Sarah and he talks about multitudes coming from them, he also says kings. Have you notice, did you notice that? 
will come from your line. Do you notice the difference here? Princes, as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him. I will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes, and I will make him into a great nation, a great people. In other words, Abram, Abraham, I have heard your desire. I understand your father's heart, but I have chosen to bless Ishmael, and he will be fruitful as well. So if you're Abraham soaking all of this in, you're thinking, oh my, all of my life, father of many, father of many who has no child, then I have one child, and now all of a sudden I hear this about my wife. Now we're hearing multitudes and multitudes coming from both of these lines. It had to be mind-boggling. He says, he will father 12 princes, P-R-I-N-C-E-S. I didn't articulate that well. Princes will come from Ishmael. These are also Semitic peoples, largely the Arab desert dwellers. This is not a direct reference to the house of Islam. Islam does not come into being until seven centuries after Christianity. Now, are most of the sons of Ishmael today Muslim? Yes. But let me just affirm to you again, because I think it always bears repeating. The Lord Jesus died for the children of Ishmael. And when you look at how it all ends, and you can do that in Revelation 4, the Lord will redeem for himself people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. There are people who are practicing Muslims now who will become followers of Christ soon. There are people all around the world, in fact, in the house of Islam who are turning to Christianity. And the really amazing part about that is, if you're familiar with what's going on with our missionaries overseas... In places where a lot of our missionaries can't quite go into these restricted countries, is that the Lord says, you know what? The government may prevent me from you guys from sending people in. The military may be able to prevent you, but no one stops me from doing what I want. So he is appearing to Muslims in visions. I am Isa. I am Jesus Christ. I am the Son of God. I am Savior. This is happening now. Let me just tell you something. When God wants to do something, he does it. You either get on board with him and you follow him or you get out of the way because he's going to accomplish his purposes. He will redeem for himself people from every nation, tribe, and tongue and just to throw one more monkey in the wrench. God has brought Muslims here. Yeah, but, you know, I don't know if I feel comfortable talking to... Uh, Muslims are coming to faith here. Have you ever stopped to think that God has brought some here so that they might encounter the gospel here? We had, my wife and I had dinner with a missionary on Friday night. It was awesome. And she was talking about, she was at the gym and she was talking about this lady. And I thought, yeah, that's the kind of person I love hanging out with. She's like, yeah, I'm at the, I'm at the gym and I'm working out. And she said, I'm running on a treadmill. And she goes, and there's this lady. And, and this, the person who was sharing with us is this real vibrant person. And she said, and I guess the lady was wearing uh, a colorful kind of like a workout hijab or whatever those that is, right? So all her eyes is all that's showing and she's running. And she's running and running, you know, and she's like, well, how would she, I would be so sweaty and just miserable. I'm dying in my gym shorts and my t-shirt, you know, this lady's got to be. And so the lady gets off and she says, she walked over and she introduced herself and she just said, oh, I'm so, and so they start talking, gives her a hug. They, guess what they're doing now? They're talking about Jesus. Gee, go figure. They're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ because she just, by faith, just took a walk across the room. And I only bring, I'm kind of camping out here because I think a lot of us need to get past the, yes, our government needs to deal with any military threat. That's the government's job, Romans 14. But Christians, you and I are called to do something radical, make disciples of all the peoples. That maybe your Muslim neighbor, your Muslim coworker, would you at least pray about it? Would you pray for them? These sons and daughters of Ishmael need to know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to see a transformed people, you let the Lord Jesus loose amongst them. Verse 21, I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. A very 
specific redemptive plan is unfolding. It's a covenant with Abraham and his seed, Isaac, and God tells Abraham, this time next year, you're going to have a son, the son of promise. That will mean 25 total years of waiting, but now that time is drawing near. So you can imagine the excitement, the wonder, the magnitude. So now we come back to this central idea again. I would ask you what you're saying 25 years, man, 100 years old and 90 years old. That's crazy. Well, so is being swallowed up, as we have talked about, by a great fish and vomited up on the shore and saying, now go preach. God is the God for whom nothing is impossible because he is God all. I've seen it. Some of you have seen it. I don't mean I haven't been vomited personally up on a shore. But I have seen God do things that I have no explanation for because he's God. Other than that's God. Your story, your thing, your things that are bigger than God, the things that are, are, are doing this or, or, or have you in that despair. I mean, I, mean, I encourage you, I, mean, I challenge you to consider here is Abraham and Sarah after waiting 25 years, 100-year-old, 99-year-old, 90-year-old rather, and God says, yes, yeah, she's going to have a child and I'm going to take care of it because God specializes in this kind of stuff. Guess why? Because when he comes through, guess who gets all the glory? God. There's no way that Abraham and Sarah can say, oh yeah, you know, uh, we've been eating correctly and uh, yeah, I'm taking good care of ourselves. It's impossible. 190, the only explanation is God. And the same goes for whatever those things are or that thing is in your life right now that you may be saying is too big for God. Can you just give it to him? It might be your past. Some of you are wrestling with things from the past that have hurt so very much or you messed up so badly and you can't imagine a God so big who would forgive you. May I tell you this? God's grace is greater than all your sin. You see, you got a very real enemy and he loves to whisper lies and his whole purpose is to, he can't, if you're, if you're God's child, he can't take your salvation. What he wants to do is to paralyze you. So some of us are paralyzed by circumstances. Some of us are paralyzed by people. Some of you are paralyzed by the past. Can you give these things to God because he's greater and bigger than all of them? Leave here changed. Leave here changed. He's so big and he's so great that God the Son lays down his life to pay the penalty for our sins on the cross and that sacrifice so sufficient that it completely covers all of my sin, shame, and guilt. That sacrifice so glorious that Christ cries out, it is finished. He does not need my help. And I am pronounced justified, not because of anything that I've done. But because of what he has done, his righteousness imputed to my account, applied to my account. I am justified by grace through faith in the almighty son of God who saves me. Not so I can sit soaking sour, but he says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow to follow him. To live for him, to walk with him. I want to be <laughs> with you on those great adventures where we're following the Lord Jesus and saying, yeah, and we're encouraging each other along the way to do just that. Because the other reason some of us have stopped with our adventures and stopped with the story, so to speak, or we get stuck, sometimes it's the circumstances are bigger in our eyes than God, sometimes it's people, sometimes it's the past, sometimes it's for a lack of encouragement. In other words, people speaking grace and truth into you. You're going to step out in faith. You know what happens a lot in church? Someone starts to get excited about Jesus, and they start getting ready to go do stuff. They want, I want to go follow. Whatever it is, Jesus is like, whack! Get back in line. You're making us look bad. Don't do that. Or you hear this really weird thing. Nah, they're young and they're faith. They'll settle down sooner or later. <laughs> okay. Wow. This passage verse, please. 
Where, where is that? We should be fanning into flame the gift the Lord has given us, and we should be encouraging each other along the way, not playing spiritual whack-a-mole. Let's go. This is not all there is to out there. <laughs> out there. The fields are ready for harvest, man. They're ripe. Let's come together and let's talk about it. No, let's pray and let's go. Let's come, let's get recharged, let's go. Let's come back, get refreshed, let's fellowship, let's go. But it's scary, but it's hard. We might, we might, yeah, but he's greater. I think some people's stories stop because they think Christianity simply is meant to be boring and it's not. We've made it that. We're going to close by looking at what Abraham does next, which is actually uh, really <laughs> a very vivid thing to try to imagine. But it ties in with faith. Faith leads to obedience. Again, going back to that, that quote that I wrote down when I heard, right information without right action is wasting everybody's time. Well, Abraham has got information. Let's see how things go. Verse 22 and following, when he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all those born in the house are bought with his money. Every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day. As God had said to him, Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and Ishmael were circumcised, and all the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. God goes up. This is a theophany. The presence of the Lord goes up and leaves Abraham there now with all that he knows that he is to do. But now Abraham has to act and he doesn't delay. It says that day, that day. Can you imagine this announcement? We know of Abraham when he's called out of Ur that he already had many, many men. Men who worked for him, who were his. He leaves Egypt with even more men. And now Abraham goes to them. And he has to say something along the lines of this. God has made a covenant with me. This is what we are to do to obey him. And I am going to obey him. And this has implications for every one of you. So every male in the camp, including himself and his 13-year-old son, circumcised, set apart to the Lord on that day. If you look at it, I don't think that's an announcement that's made where people are like, oh, okay. All right. First, I would imagine there was a measure of tension and even the possibility of a little bit of rebellion, but Abraham is locked in. This is what the Lord has told me I must do. I will be obedient. And so he makes the announcement and God takes care of all of those potential really upset men and makes everything work out just fine. And on that day, by the end of the night, rather, there was not one male in that camp who had not been circumcised. So now that we've ended the chapter, we're going to close in the last minute with our synopsis, wrapping up the key points that we need to act on today. One, what's impossible for the Lord? I'm just going to ask some of these in form of question. What is impossible for the Lord God Almighty? Nothing. Just believe that. Two, God's timing is not our Oh, wow, we struggled there. God's timing is not our. Yeah, yeah, it's not. And sometimes he delays so that there can be this one glorious explanation. This is what the living God has done. So you hang on to that. Three, in that delaying, he is also working in our lives to shape, to teach, to mold us, and to sanctify us. Even the waiting has a purpose. Can you embrace that and rest in it? 
therefore, God calls us into covenant relationship, and he takes that relationship very seriously. This is not just some, con, uh, some kind of a contract. Because five, in this case, within the confines of that covenant relationship, he calls us to walk in holiness, to be set apart, to trust him, to believe him. Six, God is faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful to keep his promises. Seven, God is absolutely faithful even when we blow it because we're going to see while you're looking at Abraham now going wow this guy's really got it man he's rolling he's going to blow it spectacularly pretty soon just like us I am so blessed and I pray that you are too to realize that my salvation is not dependent upon me being perfect enough for God to say yeah I'll keep you he's faithful always faithful eight for those who wait on the Lord while there may be trials and testing. For those who wait on the Lord, there will be times of awe, wonder, laughter, and joy. Nine. All of these promises are ultimately fulfilled through Christ. If you are a born-again Christian, you are heirs of that promise that was given to Abraham, his offspring through faith in Christ. Jesus Christ is your only way to have a relationship with the Father, my only way. We are sons and daughters of a living God by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are sons and daughters of Abraham and Sarah. Through Christ. Galatians 3, 6 through 9, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those who are of faith, faith in Christ, who are the sons of Abraham. It's not your ethnicity, it's not your background, it's not any of that. It is those who have been born again. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. Christ is the fulfillment of that. And if you are his child, you are one of the multitudes that was promised to Abraham so very long ago. So we're going to bow and we're going to pray. And I'm going to ask you one last time as we approach this time. What do you need to lay at the feet of the Lord today? The Lord God Almighty. What scripture promises are you going to need? What are you going to need to do to dig in the scriptures to find those things that relate to those things you're wrestling with? And what are you going to do in terms of being either all in in terms of your walk with him or will you continue to waffle or waver back and forth between two things because all of these uh, this, this talk about us praying and about us waiting on the Lord definitely means that we are actually walking with him in relationship so, so where are you today one if you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior this is where it has to start. Because if you have not yet done that, you can search through the scriptures all you want and start just saying, oh yeah, here's a promise that was given to, to people. But if you've not yet been born again, this doesn't apply to you, okay? You must be born again. That's the first thing. So if you've not yet given your life to Christ today, when we stand and sing, can you be so courageous as to, as to leave where you're standing and just to come forward and say, yeah, I want to give my life to Jesus. We'll set up a time to meet. We'll pray. Let's, let's talk about that. If you're looking for a church home and, and, you, and you believe this is where the Lord wants you to plant yourself to, to be on mission with this community, you can come forward and say, yeah, I want to plant myself here or we want to plant ourselves here and, and we'll set up a time to talk about that. Or maybe you just want to come up here and either rededicate your life or just come up here and pray and say, Lord, I'm going to lay these things down. You are the Lord God Almighty. Right now, it doesn't feel like, I, don't, I can't see it. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. However you need to respond, would you do so? And maybe just, we need to do that for our church. Let's just respond as the Lord may lead. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you, Father, that because we, as we walk through your word, Father, from Genesis to Revelation, we, we don't see a puny God who is limited 
Father, we see a God who is beyond our wildest imaginations, who is sovereign over all things, a God who holds all things together, a God who spoke all things together, a God who formed every single person here in their mother's womb, a God who loves so much that God the Son comes to lay down his life to save us, a God who is able to redeem us and make the spiritually dead spiritually alive, a God who says, if you will follow me and trust me, not only is your present change, but your eternity is secure. Lord, you've promised us many trials and troubles in this world. We know that, but you've also said that we are to take heart because you have overcome the world. Lord, this is where the intersection of faith and doubt is for so much of us, Lord. So many of us are struggling, and again, it may be people, circumstances, things, the past, whatever it may be. And some of us today just need to lay that down and say, Lord, here I am. You are God, and I am not. And in the grace that you give, I want to trust you. I'm tired of carrying around things that I cannot control. Father, I just pray that as we have our time of invitation, that we would each respond to you as you lead. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.